Hey, let's pray. Can you actually do me a favor if you're comfortable? Can you stand up with me? Let's all stand up together. Just put your hands out if you're comfortable. I'm not telling you have to, but just hands out this morning. Father, I pray, God, for each of us in this place this morning. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and speak to us, God? Father, would you, uh, Lord, not just let us hear words of a man. Let us not just hear, God, words on a natural, earthly level, Father, but supernaturally, spiritually, God, would you speak into the spirit of each person here, God, and would you call us forth, God? Would you call out of us, God? Would you call us forward deeper into you, God? Give us understanding, Lord, of, of who we are, how you see us, God, the plans and the purposes that you have for us, Father. So we just pray, Holy Spirit, speak and communicate to your people this morning in a language that each person here would understand, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone said... Amen. Amen. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to take this thing off the back. Getting undressed. I'm glad too, by the way, that the um, kids are coming back as well because I'm married to said admin lady and when she doesn't have all those kids to talk to, I guess who gets every single one of those words? <laughs> eh? Praise God. <laughs> no, that's good. Um... Wow, what a good morning. You're good. No, that's okay. That's all right. You know what? I reckon he's going to be a preacher one day and he can't wait. He just wants to get up on the stage, get a mic. Good on him. Good on him. Um, no dramas at all. No dramas at all. Can anyone imagine being at the Sermon on the Mount? I think when Jesus was speaking the Sermon on the Mount, I've got no doubt there were chickens and goats and probably little children running around as well. And I can't stand, I can't imagine the thought of Jesus saying, oh, you know, tell them kids to be quiet. Or, you know, I just can't imagine that. Life goes on. And uh, so please, if you've got kids here, a little bit of noise doesn't bother us. It's, it's, we're not like that. Uh, we love having your kids here. And we love having you here too. Um, hey, I was helping a guy this week. Anyone notice the beautiful big sign we've got out the front there? On the top there? You want to see that coming up? Yeah? If you didn't, then not now, but later on. Go out and have a look. We've got this big sign on the front there. Don't do it now. Big sign on the front there. <laughs> and um, that's because, remember when we first moved in, there was a cul-de-sac just past our driveway. So we only needed the one on the side. Coming from that way, you could see it. But a lot of people started saying to me, you know, when you're coming up the hill, you can't see that sign now. So we got this new one put on the front. And... Um, in order to save a, a, a you know, few dollars to put it up, I said to the guy, oh, look, I'll help you, you know, because he didn't have to bring a worker. So I came in here and I was with him and we got up on the scissor lift and we put it all, uh, uh, sign up and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but at one point he had to make some adjustments to something and he, he's talking to me and while he's talking to me, he reached into the back of his car and he grabbed his drill. And he pulled his drill out and he's looking at me and he gets his screw and he puts the screw in and then he puts the, the drill down and he, he pulls the trigger and absolutely nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. He had the drill. The drill was perfect. There was nothing wrong with the drill. He even had the manual for the drill sitting in the back of the car. The manual was perfect. It told you exactly how to use the drill. But you know what was missing? He didn't have the battery in. He didn't have the battery and he's standing there pulling the trigger, wondering why this thing's not going. And he realized, I haven't got the battery. So he went back to the car, got the battery, put the battery in, pulled the trigger and whiz, bang. The whole thing worked exactly how it was supposed to work. And I thought in that moment, thank you, Lord. I'm always looking for sermon illustrations. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit at the moment. And the Holy Spirit is like the battery that goes into that drill. Amen. It's like the battery that goes into that drill. You take the battery out. And you can have a perfect looking drill. You can even have a manual that tells you exactly how to use that drill, how that drill works. We can have the Word of God and we do have the Word of God. We've got the Bible and I'm born again and so on. But there's something about the presence of the Holy Spirit that is so integral to the life of a believer. So much so that Jesus said, I must go because if I don't go, the helper won't come. I've got to get out of here. I've done my bit. I've served my purpose down here. Now, what I'm going to do is go back to heaven. But when I go, I almost have this picture of like, I don't know why, and I don't mean to be weird, but ever watched tag team wrestling when you were kids? Anyone ever watched the wrestling? Remember back in the day when we thought it was real? I did. I thought that was this real. These guys are so tough. Look what they do to each other and no one gets hurt and so on. And uh, by the way, if you're young and you think it's real, it is. I don't want to destroy anyone's, I didn't think of that. But um, anyway, you're going to find out one day. And I almost feel, it's almost like Jesus, he's in there and he's done his job. He's beat the devil. And then he runs to the edge of the rope and he tags the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus climbs out and the Bible tells us he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And then the Holy Spirit 
comes down the day of Pentecost and indwells all believers. Instead of having Jesus in one place, in one space, in one time. If you wanted to get healed when Jesus was around, you kind of had to travel to wherever he was and go and get him to lay hands on you or speak a word over you. If you wanted to hear what he was saying, you, you had to find his itinerary and get on YouTube and Google, where is Jesus today? And then go to the village and find where Jesus was and, and see if you could get close enough to actually hear because he wasn't carrying a PA system around with him and booming it out. He was just speaking. But then Jesus said, but what I'm going to do is when I go, the Spirit's going to come. And the Holy Spirit is not going to be one person in a physical body in one place. That Spirit is going to indwell all of your bodies. And wherever you go, you're going to take that Spirit with you. So if I'm going to speak to you, you don't need to go somewhere to hear me. I'll speak to you through my Spirit that's on the inside of you. If, if, you, if you need healing or a touch from heaven, you don't have to go somewhere or go over here. If the power of God is present and it's the will of God, then God says, I can do that stuff through you where you are right now. You don't need to go to somebody special or somebody highly anointed. You can lay hands. Believers can lay hands on the sick and expect that God will do things. We can pray and God in heaven listens to us. We don't need to go to somebody else and say, can you please pray for me? Because you are so much, Judy, you're so close to God that I can see the gold just dripping off you. Um, you know, Judy, would you pray for me? No, I can pray because I can personally now come boldly to the throne of grace in time of need and I can pray. There's something wonderful and special about the Holy Spirit. And probably for a long time, I think, I think here's what I think has happened with the church, is I think we have got to a point where we kind of realise, hey, there's a real lack of power now. This is just my opinion. I don't want to put this on you, but I feel like the church in the West got to a point where we realized we're really lacking the power of God and the presence of God. So what are we going to do? We either get on our knees, we seek God, we find out why, and we make the adjustments we need to make, and we align ourselves with the plans, purposes, and the will of God, and we come back to being the people God wants us to be so He can flow through us, not just in us, but through us. But we didn't do that. I think what we did is we went, you know what? We're actually very cluey, and we're very ingen ingenious types of people now. So let's, let, how can we do this? Let's get smarter. Let's just get really hyper-intellectual. And let's, let's go and find reasons why God doesn't want to do these things anymore. Let's find reasons why God doesn't heal and doesn't speak. I was talking to a guy today, uh, this week, and he was telling me that in his particular church, he said that, that we actually don't talk about the Holy Spirit at all. He said, in fact, in our statement of faith, it says the Holy Spirit no longer helps believers. It's actually in their statement of faith. The Holy Spirit no longer helps believers. Those days are gone. And then he asked a young man in his church, and this guy, by the way, believes in the Holy Spirit. He believes in salvation, the whole box and dice, and we're having a good chat and he said about a week ago, I asked a young man in our church, I said, how's your relationship with Jesus? And this young man said, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. He said, this guy was brought up in church. He comes to our church every weekend and, 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 and goes through the whole box and does everything. But this guy said, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus. And I thought, well, that makes sense because Jesus said in John 16 that when the Spirit comes, he will glorify me. So if we don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit or we're not thinking or believing or looking for the Holy Spirit, then you'll find yourself in a place where even Jesus himself is not being glorified. So it makes sense. And I think maybe we went way over here and we thought we can do all these things. With, we just need, better, we need to get a better, better drum kit. We need a better drum kit, um, better set of guitars. We need a smoke machine. Who'd like a smoke machine? We get a big fog machine here because if we get a smoke machine, you know, it'll blow the fog out there and, and it'll, we can film it and we can say it's the Spirit. We can, you know, we, we, can, we, can, we just need to get a better preacher. To be brutally honest, I don't really know a lot about a lot. I get up here and ramble and bamble on, but you really need a really smart, deep, better thinker than me up here. And maybe if we could do that, maybe we could grow the church. Maybe if we had better coffee. Now, I'm not totally dismissing that one, all right? Maybe, maybe. I have been told a good coffee machine will up the numbers in your church by a certain percentage. But, uh, you know, now I get the applause over here for those that, that, that drink the coffee. But we've looked to so many things to try to achieve the mission that God has called us to do. Matthew 28, Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples. It's pretty simple. It's not overly complicated. Tell people about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. 
And when the Spirit of God convicts them and opens their eyes to see the reality of that, and they say yes to Jesus, then grab them by the hand and walk with them as they grow in their faith. It's not rocket science. That's what we're called to do. But I think we've tried to do it in so many other means, and I think to a large degree, we've neglected the reality of the Holy Spirit. Even though Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Even though Jesus said, I have to go. If I don't go, it's so important that I go. Because the Spirit needs to come. There's this, uh, 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 Francis Chan, anyone know Francis Chan, author and pastor? Francis Chan said this once, I'm going to have to put my glasses on now, I'm reading. He said, when you read the New Testament, you see the Holy Spirit was supposed to change everything so that this gathering of people who call themselves Christians had this supernatural element about them. We have this supernatural element about them. We don't just live in our heads. We don't just live up here in our mind. We don't just live in an intellectual space, but we acknowledge there is a supernatural space. There is a spiritual dimension to life where Jesus dwells, and our connection to that spiritual dimension is through the person of the Holy Spirit. Through the person of the Holy Spirit, which if you have given your life to Jesus, bowed your knee to Jesus, let me tell you, you have the Holy Spirit. You have, whether you speak in tongues or not, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You have the spirit on the inside of you. That spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal flesh. I reckon I could do a drop the mic and walk off stage and feel like that's powerful enough right now. What a thought. The spirit that went into that grave and tapped Jesus on the body and brought that dead body to life 2,000 years ago, went into that tomb, emptied out the tomb, and then when Jesus came up, came and filled my empty tomb and now dwells inside of me. That's an amazing thought. Philippians 1, 6, it says this. It says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, who, who began the good work in you? It says Jesus, isn't it? You're not a self-made man or self-made woman. Christianity is not about come to faith, now become a really good person. Read the rule book and do everything the rule book says so that you'll be really, really good. And the gooder you get, the more God's going to love you. That's not the message of the gospel. That's not the story of the cross. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Here's the bad news. You're never, ever going to make it because this work, he's going to have to keep doing it in you right up until Jesus returns. That means you've got a lot of stuff to deal with. Right? It means that we've got a lot of, we're, we're on a long journey here. It's not like we're going to ever get to a point where he goes, that's enough, you've made it, you are perfected, you are now good enough, I love you. <laughs> no, he's going to keep this work that he does on the inside of us. But the point is this, it's not just about willpower. It's, it's about trusting in faith and listening to, learning to listen to the voice of the Spirit and follow and obey the voice of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus uh, said this, he said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Watch this, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of this. I love what he said here. He said, you'll receive power to become, not just power to do. He didn't say you'll receive power to go out and do miracles. He said, you'll, be, you'll receive power and that power is going to make you become somebody. And what are you going to become? He says, you'll become a witness. What is a witness? The Greek word witness is the Greek word martus, where we get our modern day word, Mata. In other words, Jesus says when the Spirit comes upon you, you will become a dead person. You'll become a dead person. You'll become a dead person. Dead to your own desires, dead to your own will. You'll live for something other than just yourself. You'll live for something other than just yourself. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love what he says there. I have been crucified. Guess what? Paul died for Christ before he was ever killed for his faith. That's what he's saying. Paul goes on later on, and church history tells us that Paul was beheaded for his Christian faith, his beliefs. But he says here while he's still alive, he's still got his head on at this point. He's still got his head on. He says this, I've crucified with Christ. In other words, I'm already dead. I'm, I am the living dead. I am the walking dead. I'm here, I'm breathing and I'm living, but I am dead to everything of my own world, everything of my own life, everything of my own destiny and future, all these things that I tried to build my life up to be. When I came to faith, I realized God has plans, God has purposes, God has desires, God has things he wants, and I have sold myself out for the purpose and the cause of Jesus. This is what he's saying. 
He's saying that I no longer live. It's Christ living in me. You know, the old uh, picture we get when people come to faith and we used to say, you know, get out of the driver's seat and let Jesus jump in the driver's seat. Anyone ever heard that? Yep, I, I, I love that imagery, but I would change it a little bit. Jesus doesn't tell you to get out of the driver's seat. He, he says, you stay there. I'm going to get in the passenger seat and I'm going to start to tell you where to turn. I'm going to tell you where to go. Jesus leads us. He never drives us. Pharaoh drove the Jewish people. Didn't he? he drove them. He drove them. God doesn't drive us. He leads us. Matthew 4.19, the very first time when Jesus started calling his disciples, listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus said, come follow me. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What's he saying? He's saying, your part is to follow me. My part is to make you. If you're going to follow me, what does that mean? That means that you're going to have to be led by me. If you're going to be led by me, what does that mean? I'm going to have to communicate to you where I'm taking you. I'm going to have to speak to you. I'm going to have to somehow lead you, somehow guide you. The, the, the prim, one of the primary ministries of the Holy Spirit is the ministry of communication. It's the ministry of communication. He wants to speak to you, lead you. He wants to guide you. He wants to show you. When the Holy Spirit fell, Joel, uh, uh, in Acts chapter 2, um, uh, Peter quotes Joel, the prophet Joel. And he says, you know, your young men, you're going to see dreams and visions. And, and he goes through these things. What are dreams? What are visions? What are signs in heaven and so on? They're communication. They're ways to communicate. They're ways to communicate. What did the Holy Spirit do when he came? Everyone starts speaking in other tongues. And what happens? Everyone in the crowd heard them communicating the wonders of God in their own languages. What's the Holy Spirit doing? He's communicating. And you have inside of you what Jesus would say is the great communicator, the divine interpreter who takes the things of God, brings them down here and passes them on to you. He passes them on to us. He speaks to us the things that Jesus tells him to say. Now, here's the thing. The book of Acts, it's not the story of a church more powerful than today's church, but it is the story of a church more committed to following. The book of Acts church is no more powerful than the church of today. But I do think that that book of Acts church is a story of a church that are perhaps a little more committed to following Christ and the leading of the Spirit than maybe, possibly, we are today. And I want to talk a little bit this morning uh, about just being led by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to ask you some questions in a minute. And here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to answer them in the way that you want to answer them. I'm going to challenge each person here this morning. See, here's the thing. I'll tell myself what I want to hear. The Holy Spirit will tell me what I need to hear. Amen? There's, there's what I want to hear, but then there's what I need to hear. Anyone with a, a husband or a wife or anyone with children or anyone that works and has people that they work with or anyone has a friend knows that moment where you know they want to hear something and you want to say what they want to hear but you know what they want to hear is not what they need to hear. And what they want to hear is not going to help them. What they need to hear might offend them. What they need to hear might not make them feel good or comfortable but they need to hear it because what you need to hear is what's actually going to help you. We don't grow when we just surround ourselves with what we want to hear, when we just listen to people that tell us what we want to hear, and that includes ourselves. So I'm going to challenge you this morning. I'm going to ask you three questions. I asked them last week. We're going to get to them this week. And I want you to ask yourself these three questions and answer them as you know you should. Ask the Holy Spirit, show me the truth. And if we answer no to any of those questions, I want you to know at the end of the service, we're going to pray for some people here this morning. We're going to pray that, that the Holy Spirit will just take us to that next step, that next place, lead us. Because I want to be a person, and I know that each of you do too. We want to be a people that are led daily and, and, and hourly and yearly and monthly. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit because there are a whole bunch of voices screaming out there at you at the moment. And not all of them have your best interests at heart. But God does. Amen? God does. My God in heaven loves us. And God is always calling me forward into better and better places. Sometimes I might not feel like it's the best thing. You know, when the Lord convicts me and says, I want you to repent of something, that doesn't feel good, you know? When God speaks to me and says, love your wife better, I'm going, oh God, I don't know. I will if you make her love me better first. But it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes God speaks and says, I want you to give. And I go, well, God, I don't know if I've got enough. I don't want to give her. But every time we step out in obedience to God, every time we follow Jesus, blessing follows. And if you don't believe me, 
read Genesis, start at Genesis 1.1 and go right through to the end of Revelation. Every time God speaks and people obey, it results in blessing. It just simply does. I want to talk today about a man named Julius. Anyone know who Julius is? There's a guy called Julius. I didn't even really know his name until I sort of stumbled across this story a few days ago and started reading about it. But there's a man by the name of Julius. And Julius is given the, uh, the job, the task of escorting the Apostle Paul on his way to Rome in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 27. Julius is the Roman centurion that's given the, the responsibility to get Paul uh, onto a boat and to make sure that Paul gets across to Rome. We don't have a lot of passages about Julius. There's only a couple of times that he's actually mentioned in the Word of God. But in Acts chapter 27, let me find it here. Acts chapter 27... Verse 1, it says this. It says, When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about Julius. We don't know a lot about Julius, but I think Julius was a pretty nice guy. Uh, I don't have this scripture up there, but if you go to verse 3, it says this. It says, The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends, so they might provide for his sins. So Julius sounds like a pretty fair, nice individual. He sounds like a pretty uh, uh, kind of guy that you might want to hang out with, you know, in another scenario. But of course, in this situation, Paul's a prisoner and he's being taken to Rome and eventually that will be the end of his days. If we fast forward on from verse 9 through to verse 12, it says this. It says, Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them. Paul warns them. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, what's his name? Julius. So Paul's saying, Julius, here's what's going to happen. If you keep going the way you're going, there's going to be great loss of life and loss. This is going to be a disaster. If you keep heading in the direction you're heading in, this is not going to bode good for you or for anybody else on this journey. This is Paul speaking. But really, we know it's who? It's the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul. Jesus said that when the Spirit comes, he'll speak to you, he'll tell you things to come. And the Spirit's speaking to Paul. And Paul, as a representative of God, is speaking to Julius, who's not a Christian, and saying, hey, Julius, here's the deal. If we go this way, this is not going to end very well. Instead of listening to what Paul had said, he followed the advice of the pilot, and of the owner of the ship, since the harbour was unsuited to winter in. The majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a a harbour in Crete, facing both southwest and north. So bottom line, they're about to go on this journey, and Paul comes, and Paul says, Julius, don't go that way. This is going to end disastrous. And Julius is thinking about that, and he's got the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to him. But then he has the voice of the captain, The the, the captain of the ship says, no, no, we can make it. We can do it. And then the owner of the ship chimes in and goes, yep, we can do this. We're going to go ahead. And then it says, then the majority of the people on the ship all agreed, yeah, let's go. So all of a sudden, he's standing there with the voice of Paul. He's got the voice of the captain. He's got the voice of the pilot. And he has the voice of the majority. And all these voices are speaking to him and telling him what to do. You ever feel like that in life? All these different voices are coming at you from all different angles trying to get your attention. And here's the thing. He's about to go into a really bad storm. When you're about to go into a really bad storm, I think the smart thing to do is listen to the right voice. Listen to the right voice. Because had he listened to Paul, he wouldn't have ended up in the storm in the first place. And when you're in the storm, nobody likes being in the storm. I remember being in a storm once with my wife on a boat. And I learnt this lesson very, very harshly as she sat there with her hands digging into the wooden rails of a ship in the middle of the Solomon Islands as we're going between islands and we didn't know that a cyclone had come across because we just got out of Australia. We were the last plane out of Australia. And we, we landed in there at midnight and I ran down to the harbour and just went to a fishing boat and said, can you take us across to the island we're going to? And the fishing boat said yes. And so one o'clock in the morning, we're on the boat 
And we're sailing between the islands and it's nice and calm. And all of a sudden, as we got further, the boat starts going like this. And then it gets bigger and bigger. Then it's just up and down and side. And I can tell Jackie's panicking. She doesn't like boats. So I thought, I'll calm my wife down. So I said to Jackie, Jackie, it's okay. The locals aren't carrying on screaming and yelling, so it must be safe. Just as I said that, all these locals start going, oh, rah, 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 rah. the captain and the crew came running out. There's big barrels of petrol on the, on the uh, boat and the rope snapped and the barrels of petrol are sliding side to side as the boat's doing this. Chickens are squawking, goats are going off, babies are crying, mothers are praying in all kinds of tongues and languages. I thought, strike one, that didn't work. And then I thought, okay, here's what I'll say to her. I'll say, look, and I don't know why I thought this one would work. If the boat does go over, God gave Noah the basics of shipbuilding. So you know what? The ship will come back up. It'll be okay. I don't know why I thought that was going to work, but that was a big strike too. She just looked at me. That look where you don't need to say nothing. And I thought, okay, what can I think of now? I'm leaning against the side of the boat, holding it on like this while it's going up and down. And my final thing was, Jackie, at least there's no water coming into the boat yet. And literally, as I said, that a wave jacked up behind me, hit me in the head. I flew across the deck of the floor, laying there with water all over me. I just got up and said, Lord, she needs to hear from you. Because I'm not helping. My voice isn't enough, God. She needs to hear from you. And we all find ourselves in situations like that. Might not be on a boat. It could be in your financial world. It could be in your relationship. It could be in your marriage. It could be with your children. Could be in friendships, could be with your employment, could be with your health, could be with the next decision you've got to make. Where am I going to move to? Who am I going to marry? There's all kinds of decisions that we make. And there's all kinds of voices and people that are willing to scream out their opinions and their perspectives. There's the voice of culture that will tell you this is how it should be done. There's the voice of friends, there's the voice of family. Very well meaning, a lot of them, but quite often not hearing from God. They've got. Quite often they'll have their own perspectives, their own opinions, their own uh, angles that they bring to the table. Then we've got the voice of our own insecurities. You couldn't do that. You're not good enough. No one will listen. The voices of our own fears. Voice of our own inadequacy. The voice of our own picture of who we think we are that quite often is very, very different to the picture God has and how he sees you. We have all these voices that are competing and screaming at us and trying to tell us you need to go this way and you need to go that way. In John 16, verse 12 to 14, I love this when Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit. I love this passage. He says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. In other words, I've got more things I want to say to you, but you can't handle it right now. But there will be a day when you will be able to handle it and I will speak to you. Even though I'm going, but I'm going to send the Spirit. He says, but when He, the Spirit of truth comes, watch this, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He'll speak only what He hears. So the Holy Spirit's hearing from God and He will tell you what is yet to come. He'll glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he'll make known to you. Think about that. It's like the Holy Spirit is this, this uh, uh, person in between you and the Father. And he's hearing from the Father. And he's taking that and then he's passing that on to you in a language that you, God's child, can understand. And speaking to you. He's guiding you. He's wanting to lead you. The Spirit of God is wanting to lead and he's wanting to guide. How much attention do we give to the voice of the Spirit? How much attention do we give to the leading of God? in our lives we can come here on a sunday and get a warm and fuzzy feeling during worship and we can we can we can even our emotions can even be overtaken and 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 so on but when we walk out the door for the other six and a half days of the week how much of our time is spent with a conscious awareness that that same spirit that moved upon you here his same spirit's with you in the car he's with you in the lunchroom he's with you when you're digging a hole he's with you when you're teaching kids he's with you when you're doing whatever it is that you do and his affection for you is just as strong and god's not saying to him i want you to wait till sunday to say something to them The Spirit of God's not saying, hey, wait till Sunday. Like the Holy Spirit sits in a meeting room with the Father for six and a half days taking notes. And then on Sunday, he goes, okay, right, I'm going to run down to Patrick now and just unload all this. Hey, Patrick, this is what God's saying. Okay, next one, I've got to go. Okay, go. Okay, go. Extra blessing. It's my wife, for those of you that don't know. So I heard someone say this week, 
it's a lot harder to follow Jesus now than it was for those in the Bible. I actually thought about that and I thought, you know what, I actually think they're right. It was more dangerous back then to follow Jesus. But it's harder now to follow Jesus simply because we have so many more voices that have so much access to us. So much access to us. So I posed a question last week. In the 10 minutes to go, I want to ask you these three questions. In a world filled with competing voices, intellectual perspectives, compelling emotional sway, all screaming out for your and my allegiance and obedience, do I still, like the believers in the early church, do I have an inclination, an expectation and a motivation to be led by the Spirit in my life? I'm going to ask you three questions and I want you to just answer them to yourself. Number one, are you inclined to want to be led by the Spirit? (laughs) Don't be sorry, the Holy Spirit's teaching us we need to be like children. It's all good, it's all good. Do you have an inclination to want to be led by the Spirit? Question number one. By an inclination, I mean, do you have a tendency or a, 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 a natural tendency to sway towards the Spirit and to listen? When you are faced with situations in life and circumstances, do you, are you inclined, do you lean into the Spirit to listen to Him or are you leaning into something else? Is the Spirit an afterthought? <laughs> Is the Holy Spirit just an afterthought for you? The very one that God said would come, be with you, would guide you, would teach you, would lead you into all things, would glorify Jesus. Is he an afterthought to you in your life when you face trials and challenges? Or, or do you lean into the Spirit? Is the Spirit something you consciously go, okay, God, before, before anything else, before I go anywhere else, before I, I ask, before I, God, I just want to ask you first, Lord. Because God, you said you would lead me. You said that you would guide me? Are we inclined to want to be led by the Spirit? And it's not a dumb question to ask because we would assume that everybody would say yes, but the truth is a lot of people would say no. Some people don't want to be led by the Spirit because we don't know where the Spirit's going to take us. The first place that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 4, he's filled with the Spirit, then he's led by the Spirit. The first place he's led to was a wilderness, a place of tempting and testing. And sometimes the Spirit will lead us to go and pray for someone who's sick and we love that, don't we? Sometimes the Spirit will lead us to share our, our, the gospel or to share a testimony. Sometimes the Spirit will lead us to a place like that where there's great victory and jubilation to pray for someone that's in satanic bondage. Sometimes He'll lead us there, but sometimes, sometimes He'll lead us to a place of conviction. Sometimes He'll lead us to a place of repentance. Sometimes He'll lead us to a place and He'll say, hey, see that thing, I want to talk to you about that thing. I want you to let go of that thing. I want you to pick that thing up. Acts 1.8, you'll be filled with power to become first before you do. There's a reason why Jesus was filled with the Spirit and the first thing that happened, he was led by the Spirit. It wasn't until Jesus learned to be led by the Spirit that he was empowered by the Spirit. There's a reason. Because it's the Spirit's power, not ours. And some people don't want to be led by the Spirit. If we're honest, some of us sit here today and we would say, I actually don't want to be led by the Spirit. I don't want to look like some of those freak shows I've seen out there. You know? Let me tell you something I know about the Spirit. And Jesus said it in John 16. He will glorify Jesus. I'm sorry, but if you're barking on all fours like a dog, I'm looking at that going, is Jesus, how much glory is Jesus getting out of this? I'm struggling with that one, I'm sorry. If you're snorting like a pig and rolling around, I'm wondering how much glory Jesus is getting out of that one. Jesus is not going to turn you into a freak show. He wants to lead you to safe harbors. He wants to lead you to blessing. He wants to lead you to good places, to good things, Right? But some of us, we don't want to be led because we're afraid that he's going to lead us to a bad place. Everywhere Jesus leads you is a good place. Everywhere the Spirit takes you is a good place, even if it doesn't feel like it in the moment. There's always blessing in obedience because God loves us and he wants to take us to good places. In John chapter 5, there's a man at the pool of Bethesda and Jesus walks up to him, this ancient hospital where people are sick and they're laying around waiting for the stirring of the waters and the first person in is healed by an angel. And Jesus says this to this man who's waiting there, been there for years. Jesus says, do you want to be made well? Sounds like a dumb question, doesn't it? But it's not really a dumb question because Jesus knows humans. He knows us people. He knows us people. And, And so do you have an inclination to be led by the Spirit? Listen to the voice of the Spirit inside you this morning. Because if you answer no to any of these three questions, then I think the Lord wants to do something in our hearts. He wants to change us. Because he wants us to answer yes to these three things. So 
Some people are afraid of being led. What if he says? What if he takes me to? What if he asks me to give up? What if he asks me to stop, to confess? He who has ears to hear. And the fact is that some of us don't. We don't want to hear. Hey. The Spirit can only lead a person who wants to follow. Amen? Number two, second question. First one, am I inclined to be led by the Spirit? Second one, am I expecting the Spirit to lead me? Am I actually expecting the Spirit to lead me? So here's the truth, right? I want to be the next captain of the West Tigers. I'm inclined to be the next captain of the West Tigers. I want to be the captain of the West Tigers and lead us to a grand final victory. But am I expecting that to happen? Probably not. Probably not. Just because I want something doesn't mean that I'm expecting it to happen. Is that right? There are a lot of things in life we want, but just because we want something, just because we're inclined towards it, doesn't mean that we're actually expecting that thing to come to pass. So you might be wanting to be led by the Spirit. So the next thing is, if you answer yes to that, do you actually, are you actually expecting the Spirit to lead you? Are you actually expecting it? So expectation creates focus when it comes to the things of God. Expectation of the Spirit leading me means I wake up each day and I open my eyes and I'm looking for where He's leading me. I wake up each day and I open my ears and I'm listening to where he may be taking me, where he may be calling me, what he may be saying to me. That's what expectation does. That's what expectation does, is it gives a spiritual focus. Without expectation, you'll blindly follow the loudest voice in any given moment, the voice of culture, the voice of your own emotions, insecurities, inferiority, your own background. You'll listen to the voice of the devil, the crowd, popular opinion, intellect, Safety, security, you'll listen to all these other voices. But if we're expecting to hear from the Spirit, then it gives us a sense of focus and positions us to actually begin to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us. And maybe you're not expecting because you don't believe the Spirit would want to communicate with a person like you. Now, if that's you, what you're really saying is the Father doesn't want to communicate to you. That's what you're really saying. Because where's the Spirit getting His communication from? John 16, Jesus said, He's hearing from me, And he's passing it on to you. So if you think the Holy Spirit doesn't want to speak to you, what you're really saying is God the Father doesn't want to talk to you. God the Father doesn't want to talk to you. Because he's speaking. See, the Father's not looking for reasons to not communicate with you. Uh, James 1.5, James gives us this little insight into asking God for wisdom. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Everyone say, without finding fault. In other words, you're sitting there going, God, I need your wisdom. And God's going, well, let me think about whether I should give that to you. You're a bit of a scumbag, actually. I... Yeah. You haven't been praying. You're not living a really holy life. You've made a few mistakes there. Don't think I didn't see them. I'm God. I saw the way you were thinking the other night. I... You haven't given enough at church. You didn't come to the prayer meeting at 9 o'clock. I don't know if I can be bothered really giving you with. God's not inclined to look for reasons to not bless. God's natural inclination as a father is to bless us. His heart is favorable towards you. Whether it be wisdom or whether it be the answering of a question or the leading or the guiding. But some of us think that God doesn't want to speak to us. So we don't have any expectation. Let me tell you, the heart of the father is to communicate to your children. The heart of a good father is to communicate with your children. We're not sitting back waiting to see if you've nailed it. So do you have an inclination to be led by the Spirit? Do you have an expectation that the Spirit will lead you? And the third question, are you motivated to follow the leading of the Spirit? Are you motivated to follow the leading of the Spirit? See, I can want to be led by the Spirit. I can also expect the Spirit to guide and lead me. But once he does, am I motivated enough to go where he's leading me? Do I actually want to do it? Am I inclined? Am I expecting? And then am I motivated enough to actually follow the Spirit? Because I can tell you now, I've known lots of people that were inclined toward the Spirit. They wanted to hear what the Spirit said. They were expecting and the Spirit spoke, but they turned around and said no. And didn't do it. And I'll bet you, every person in this room, at some point, you've got a story where you knew the Spirit of God was leading you in a certain direction. You're inclined, you're expecting, you heard, you knew, but you said no. And you disobeyed. You didn't do what the Holy Spirit said. How many of you have got unfinished spiritual business? The Spirit's communicated something to you today, yesterday, last week, last month, last year, 10 years ago. And you know that that invitation is still on the table, but you still haven't done it. Well, it's never too late. If that invitation's on the table still, it's never too late to begin to be led by the Spirit.
Romans 8, verse 14 and 15, Paul writes this. He says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Not those who are perfect, those who don't get it wrong, not those who don't make mistakes, not those who don't stumble every now and then, not those who don't have a fault. He says, are those who are led. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And verse 15, he says, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. I love that. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry the most, most intimate of cries to our Heavenly Father, Abba, Father. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves. God will never make you do what he's asking you. Isn't that beautiful? He'll never force you. He'll never make you. God hands out invitations. Invitations to us to be led opens doors but he doesn't push us through them so we're not slaves we're not being made to follow we're not being forced to respond or participate and we're not being punished if we don't but when we don't respond or participate we do miss out if you go on later on and you look at the story here with julius you know what happens they go out to see the storm whips up paul prays again looks like everyone's going to die and paul comes back and this time paul says hey I prayed, God says we're going to lose the ship and everything, but we're not going to lose any life. And it's funny, Julius wasn't listening to Paul up to that point. And then all of a sudden, from the, that point on in the story, everything Paul says, he's got Julius' attention. It cost him something in the end, but it didn't cost him his life. God's grace is beautiful. I'll get the band to come back up. Dave, you want to come back up, mate? Selwyn Hughes. Who knows Selwyn Hughes? He wrote this uh, Every Day with Jesus, little devotional book. Selwyn Hughes said this once. He said, It's necessary for Christians to receive divine guidance as we make our way through this world because we are carrying out purposes that are not our own. Think about that for a second. It's necessary for Christians to receive divine guidance as we make our way through this world because we, believers in Jesus, those of you that have bowed your knee to him, those of you that follow him, we are carrying out purposes that are not our own on we need divine guidance jesus told us that the spirit will speak only what he hears so here's the reality the holy spirit wants to give you just in time message not a just in case message i stand up here on a sunday and if all you're doing is listening to me you're getting a just in case message i'm standing up here and i'm saying hey here's what the bible teaches da, da, da. if you're listening to me you might go hey that i can see it in the bible i can see it's true it makes a lot of sense i feel like it's right I don't need it right now. So I'm just going to put that one in the shelf just in case. But if you're listening to the Spirit, the Spirit will take my just-in-case message and He'll interpret it and make it a just-in-time message for you. He'll take out what you need to hear and He'll speak to you. I would rather be getting just-in-time messages from God than just-in-case messages from man. I need just-in-time messages. I need just-in-time messages from God when I'm going through stuff in life. My marriage, my children, church, my friends, my work, whatever it is. God wants us to have just-in-time communication with Him, not just-in-case, which is what we get most Sundays, unless you're the person that comes here with an open ear and an open eye who's inclined to the Spirit, expecting the Spirit, motivated to obey, and you're saying, Spirit of God, speak to me today. Speak to me today. We've got a tendency to lean on our own natural intelligence too heavily. We rely on intellect and natural human senses to the point where it's no wonder many of us have very few testimonies of the Spirit's power and very little ability to walk by faith and not by sight anymore. Walking by faith and being led by the Spirit can often require doing that which our natural senses, our intellect, our insecurities, our culture, our experience, etc. struggle to agree with. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. We all know this one, but do we really know this one? Trust in the Lord. Everyone say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him. That's the Hebrew word yada. It means have direct intimate contact. That's what that word means. Have direct intimate contact. In all your ways, direct intimate contact with Him and He'll make your paths straight. That means something. It means that trusting God and being led by the Spirit will run contrary to your own understanding at times. Sometimes trusting in the Lord is going to run contrary to my own natural understanding. What do I do in those moments? Well, I've got to learn to cultivate obedience to Jesus. There are places my own understanding can never take me. 
There are places my own understanding would never go. But the Spirit of God would. I think a lot of people miss out on the power of the Christian life, the adventure of the Christian life. We miss out on experiences that build our faith. We miss out on testimonies that help build the faith of others. We miss out on miracles of transformation and provision that are meant to bring glory to God on the earth. We miss out on circumstances that will help shape us into the image of Jesus, all because we lean way too heavily on our own understanding and not on the Spirit. And as God's people, we need to do life God's way. And God said, I'm going to send my Spirit. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to change you. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to meet your needs. I'm going to call you. I'm going to anoint you. I don't think David Wilkerson would have ended up in New York ministering to gang members and addicts had he lent on his own understanding. He went on to start Teen Challenge. You can read about that in his book, The Cross and the Switchblade. I don't think Jackie Pullinger would have necessarily got off a boat in Hong Kong because the Holy Spirit said to and walked the streets of Kowloon, the walled city, had she lent heavily on her own understanding. You can read her story too, Chasing the Dragon. I don't think Lauren Cunningham would have started the biggest mission agency in the world, YWAM, if he decided to live his life by his own understanding alone. He's got a great book, Is That Really You God? I would have never got my first guitar had I lent on my own understanding because I asked the guy to give it to me because I felt like the Holy Spirit said, ask him to give you this brand spanking new seven, eight hundred dollar guitar I just bought. And I said, you must be kidding God. And I didn't do it. And three months later, the Spirit convicted me and I walked up to him and said, man, I feel embarrassed saying this, but it felt like God told me three months ago to come and ask you, would you give me that? I didn't even know how to play guitar. And he, he did this, he went, oh, you know what? Three months ago, the Spirit spoke to me to give it to you. I just forgot, here it is. Gave it to me. It's lucky I didn't lean on my own understanding there. We wouldn't be in this building if we had lent on our own understanding with about 28, 30 people in the GSAC all those years ago. INC going, send your figures. And we sent the money and they said, oh, you can't afford that. We went, eh, well, we know we can't afford it. You're saying that and we're agreeing with you, but the Spirit's saying this is our place. We need to take it. Praise God for great leadership that said, you know what, we'll, we'll back you. Go for it. And here we are. We wouldn't be here if we trusted our own understanding. Me and my wife wouldn't have moved to India as missionaries if we trusted our own understanding. A lot of you people in this room, you wouldn't have achieved some of the things you've achieved, seen the things you've seen, done the things you've done, had you lent fully on your own understanding. There's a lesson in that. We need to be people of the Spirit. Amen. Okay, listen, I've gone a few minutes over what we normally go. We normally finish around probably 20, 25 past 11. So if you're visiting, apologies for that. What we're going to do now is we've got tea and coffee next door. We've got a whole bunch of beautiful morning tea that's in that fridge there that we're going to transport outside left over from the fantastic women's night that the women had last night. But what we're going to do here in this place is I'm going to just open up the front here. If you feel like the Holy Spirit's spoken to you, if you say no to any of those things, no, I'm not inclined to be led by the Spirit. No, I'm not expecting to hear from the Spirit. And no, I'm not really motivated to do what the Spirit says, even if He does. If you answer no to any of those questions, I would love to pray with you this morning. Because to be the people that God wants us to be, we've got to be people of the Holy Spirit, amen? We've got to be people that step a little bit outside of ourselves and begin to trust God again, even those of us that have been hurt in the past. God's not going to lead us anywhere. That's not a place of blessing and goodness for us. Amen. Let's stand. I'm going to pray for us. Then the tea and coffee and afternoon tea people, we can run off and have that or the, whatever you're doing. But these guys are going to lead. And if you'd like prayer, I just want you to come forward. We want to pray. Get some people together and let's pray today. Let's believe that the Holy Spirit will begin to shift and move some things in our lives in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for uh, our, our, our time together, the opportunity to be together with you, God. Father, we don't. This is not a Lions Club. It's not a ritual. It's not a, uh, God, something that we just do because it feels good on a Sunday morning, Lord. God, we want to meet with you, Father. We want to be transformed and we want to be changed. And we believe everything that you said about the Spirit that you sent to be with us, Lord. That you would lead us, that you would guide us, and that you would glorify Jesus amongst us. So, Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name for every person in this room. That, Lord, you would continue to take us deeper and further on this journey of trusting you, on this journey of being led by you, on this journey of hearing, learning to discern and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in amongst all the other voices that are screaming and yelling at us, Lord. And as this next week unfolds, I pray that there would be testimonies 
testimony upon testimony of miracles, of people hearing, of people getting just that inclination. I wonder if it is, could it be, maybe it is, I'm not sure. But stepping out in faith and seeing the good hand of God in their life and around their life and through their life. I pray for that this week, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen, Amen. Amen.